Okay, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulillah. Firstly, thank you very much uh, for everyone to, uh, for attending this session. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank the organization um, for uh, setting up this very important type of initiative because uh, I was smiling when I saw the video. Uh, I've been to Turkey obviously before and I've seen the great uh, opportunity that there is for Islam, but also that um, in my part of London, uh, there's a lot of Turkish people, uh, there's a lot of Turkish mosques, there's a famous mosque actually, um, which uh, has a restaurant at the bottom and a lot of non-Muslims even go to that restaurant. And it's, it's very important that we can share Islam through culture. So it's not just like, okay, we're talking about Islam, we're talking about culture. And why this is in particular interest to me is because, you see, um, before 9-11, before, um, you know, all these uh, sort of uh, terrorist attacks, um, the reputation of the Muslims was still that Muslims are barbaric, Muslims are evil, Muslims are backward, Muslims are barbarians. And if you look through the Victorian literature, you look through the French literature, you look through the literature uh, in the late 20th century, uh, sorry, the late 19th century and the early 20th century, you find that there was a huge amount of literature which was uh, geared towards priming the population against Turkish people. And you even find uh, Charles Darwin, interestingly, talking about the Turks in a very negative way and, and also other people. And it's absolutely amazing that now, um, for many people in Britain uh, and also in Spain and other parts, Turkey is actually a destination, a holiday destination, and previously, Turkey was actually the hostile Muslim, right, nation. Uh, so this is a golden opportunity, and I'm really happy to see initiatives such as this one, which is, util which is utilizing one of the landmarks um, in Turkey to actually convey the message of Islam. Now, what I wanted to do is, I didn't want to give this as an academic le uh, lecture, as a long lecture, boring lecture. Um, I have several videos on this, which I can give to Anis, and you guys can watch them. I want to go through some things quite briefly, and I want you to have more interaction, right? So, um, Anis, whenever there's a question or there's something, just uh, put on your mic and just say, we've had this question, and I'll, I'll say whether we should answer it later or answer it now. Um, everyone watching, I suggest you ask questions throughout the presentation, okay? Um, I'm going to, again, like I said, I'm going to skip through going through all the details of the presentation because this presentation itself, if I was to go through it properly with Q&A, it would be over three hours. <laughs> so we're trying to make things very simple and we're trying to teach you just the basics that you need to actually convey Islam. So the first thing to note is, um, actually even before this, um, what's important to remember when we're talking to people who, when you say to them, do you believe in God? And they say, I believe in evolution or I believe in Darwin's theory, is it's not always about challenging the theory. It's not always about challenging how biological evolution works. We simply have to ask them, well, if biological evolution is true, does that mean there's no God? Does that mean there's no creator? Because at the end of the day, it's not about showing that Darwinism is incorrect or Darwinism has flaws or Darwinism has holes or evolution has issues. That's kind of irrelevant. What's relevant is that people use it as an argument against God, right? And we want to show them that actually, whether you believe in Darwin's theory of evolution or you don't believe in Darwin's theory of evolution, it doesn't undermine God. That's the main thing. The reason why this is important is because obviously I deal with the academic side, looking at the problems with the theory or the assumptions, even though it's a valid model, um, some people who watch the content and when they're talking to a non-Muslim, they start to debate about whether the theory is valid or not. And that is not really relevant. When you are a, a guide for tourists who come to Turkey, you have a very small, limited amount of time that you can convey Islam to them. You don't want to get bogged down into questions about hijab or questions about um, you know, Sharia or questions about Adam alayhi salam or you want to just talk about Tawheed, you want to talk about the oneness of Allah and if the person says, look, I believe in evolution I don't believe in God, you just need to say to them, well, you can believe in God and evolution, it doesn't actually matter challenging evolution is good for you as a Muslim to know just for the not uh, the, the sort of um, 
for your own knowledge and also if you get into a deep conversation with somebody. But generally in dawah conversations, which you're having, especially with tourists, you just stick to God's existence. And, you, and, you, and whether the person believes in the theory or not is kind of irrelevant. I hope that that message is clear right from the beginning. Okay, so everybody I'm going to mention today, they're not going to be people who believe in creationism, intelligent design. It can be mainstream secular uh, people who believe in, uh, you know, science as a way of acquiring knowledge about the world. Okay, the first thing to note is Darwin's theory is a valid scientific model theory and paradigm. This is very important to understand. A lot of people, they think because there's problems with the theory, that means it's not a valid scientific theory. That's not true. A theory can have multiple problems or it can have no problems at all. It's still valid. It's still a valid scientific theory. So what we're saying is it's a valid scientific theory. And the first thing is it doesn't undermine God. It doesn't undermine God. This is extremely important to understand. Secondly, it doesn't undermine religion because people have tried to make Islam and evolution, Islam and Darwinian evolution compatible, right? Um, there's various different models to try and do this. In fact, uh, what's of interest uh, to people like me who work within this field is the earliest ways of explaining um, how potentially Darwinian evolution can fit Islam was actually done in the late, um, late 20th century uh, late, late 19th century, actually, by uh, Turkish scholars, Ottoman scholars. Um, and the earliest account that we have is from the 1890s, right? Which is only, if you think about it, about 20 years after Darwin, right? It's, it's, it's not that long at all. And uh, I forgot the name of this particular Turkish scholar, but he basically spoke about if Darwin's theory is true, how can we accept it within Islam? And he gave his own model. But then he said, we don't have enough knowledge to say it's true, so we don't need to have that discussion. The reason why I'm highlighting this is because this question always pops up. Fair enough, we're learning what's wrong with Darwin's theory. But then the question is, is it possible to reconcile evolution and Darwin's theory? And some Muslims are obviously say no, some Muslims say yes, some Muslims have different models. I don't get into that discussion. And I think that discussion is irrelevant because if we can show that Darwinian evolution doesn't undermine God, Darwinian evolution does not undermine uh, the Quran, then it doesn't matter whether somebody thinks it's completely incompatible or someone thinks there's some compatibility or someone thinks there's somewhere in between. Uh, that's why I want everybody to remember as well that this is not about how compatible it is with Islam. That's... Um, that's irrelevant for the Dawah. That's irrelevant for our way of thinking. Okay. Now, standard idea of evolution is human chimp ancestry. And you have this idea of a chimp-like creature slowly evolving and becoming more and more complex and more and more intelligent and more and more bigger and better and so forth. However, this is a misunderstanding. The reason why it's a misunderstanding is that Darwinian evolution doesn't work by progression. It doesn't work by things getting bigger and better and faster and smarter and this type of thing. It's actually a theory in which um, things just adapt to the environment. And you can't say that, say, Isaac Newton, who's super intelligent, is better than, say, some, a farmer in the Philippines. Because a farmer in the Philippines, chances are he probably has at least one wife and a couple of children. And Isaac Newton died a virgin, right? He never got married. So from an evolutionary perspective, it's not the intelligence of Isaac Newton that makes him so great. It's, well, he never had any children. So evolution, Darwinian evolution looks at the fitness of a person in terms of how many fertile offspring they actually have. So this idea of progress, this idea of things getting better over time, this is a misunderstanding. And if we can be wrong about the basics of evolution, which most people believe this image of evolution is correct, then what else can we be wrong about? But one of the things we also realize is that there's a difference between um, scientific theory and truth, right? A scientific theory is a valid theory, but it doesn't mean it's true literally. It doesn't mean it's a, a fact in the literal sense. And this is even acknowledged by the most hardcore 
proponents of Darwinism, like, for example, the Oxford professor Richard Dawkins. In his book, A Devil's Chaplain, he says, we must acknowledge the possibility new facts come to light, which will force our successors of the 21st century to abandon Darwinism or modify beyond recognition. So here he's talking not about evolution as a general process, but about the mechanism which Darwin came up with, which is known as Darwinism or neo-Darwinism. So even the most hardcore proponent understands it can change. And the reason why it can change is everything in science is based on induction. Induction means you take a, a limited set of data and you come up with a general conclusion. But you can always come up with new data which can challenge your theory and an existing theory can have many problems. So because of the philosophy of science, we know that science cannot give you certainty. And there's several problems in the philosophy of science for people who believe science gives you certainty. There's problem of induction in which you can always have novel data which challenges your previous theory. You have underdetermination in which the same data can give rise to alternative theories. This is something that even Darwin spoke about. You have problem of unconceived alternatives and you have uh, the problem of sensation and so on and so forth. So you have these type of issues, which is why science doesn't give you absolute certainty. Even Charles Darwin, he said something similar to this in The Origin of Species. I'm not gonna read out the entire quote. Um, for anybody who wants this presentation, um, I'll give this to Anise and he can give it out to whoever wants it. Okay, there's a difference between evolution and Darwinism. Evolution was known for hundreds of years before Darwin. It simply means biological change over time. Um, Darwin came up with a particular version of evolution, which was blind, which was mechanical, which is why it's a problem for religious people. Um, because the theory supposedly says there's no need for God, things just work out blindly and um, uh, there's random uh, mutations which are selected and then you get new organisms over time. Okay, but there's an issue. Science has a rule known as methodological naturalism, right? Methodological naturalism, which be actually, before I get into this rule, um, I may be going a little bit fast <laughs> because uh, obviously this is a complicated topic and I, I want to get to the Q&A rather than get into these sort of details. Anis, are there any questions so far? So far, there's no questions. And I think it's good if you go a little bit details, inshallah. The problem with the details is I'm trying to, if I go through details, I won't be able to finish the presentation. And uh, this, this takes a, like, an hour and a half to three hours. Well, let's do as much as you can, then we'll have yeah. the session too, inshallah. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. And uh, maybe next time we'll have more Q&A, and this time we're just going through the presentation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do this again. No, no issues at all with my side, inshallah. Okay. And also, Anis, I can give the students here, I can give them uh, two videos to watch which will help them before they come to the next session, which is in a lot more detail, inshallah. Okay. Science has a rule known as methodological naturalism. And the rule basically says, everything that we study has to have a natural origin. Every effect has to have a natural cause and so on and so forth. So this rule basically means the scientist cannot refer to God, cannot refer to anything supernatural, cannot refer to anything like this. So this rule means right from the onset, there's three things which have to be true. There is no design, right? There is no design because everything is natural. There's no independent ancestry. Everything is linked to each other because we cannot have this idea of lots of organisms popping into existence. They have to have a simple origin and they all have to converge to a common ancestor. And there has to be a naturalistic purpose. Purpose has to be purely natural. There has to be uh, something very natural about that. Um, so the first thing to note is, because of methodological naturalism, which is the rule, no matter how designed something looks like this particular picture, uh, this is a biological structure, it is not designed because of that rule. So Francis Crick, he puts it this way. Biologists must constantly keep in mind that what they see was not designed, but rather evolved. The important thing to know is 
this is just within the scientific theory, but this doesn't mean in reality we cannot believe it was designed. And we're going to get onto that later. Also, no separate ancestry. So everything has to be linked to everything else. Uh, we can't have this idea of many different organisms popping into existence. And um, even if somebody was to come up with the idea, this is not true, by the way. This is a joke yeah, that I put up, this, this pig turning into a human being. This is not like, like, this isn't the way evolution works. But I put it up here to show that even this is at least a scientifically testable hypothesis. Yeah, but the idea that God created man in whichever way, that's not testable. So that's why scientists, they discard anything supernatural. They say we will not uh, take that as an example. Now, if you're in a classroom and the person there is talking about biological evolution and they say we know biological evolution is is true because of what we know in genetics what we know in bioinformatics what we know in paleoanthropology and linguistics and so on and so forth there's three things that we know about darwinian evolution which nobody can deny the first is that it's based on a probabilistic framework the second is that there's multiple assumptions and the third is that there's disputes about the actual theory. And the way that one particular journal explains the probabilistic nature is it says it's trying to work out the plot of Leo Tolstoy's War and Peace, which is one of the biggest books in English literature, with 99.999% of the data missing, right? So this is an incredibly difficult thing to actually do. Another way of thinking about it is it's like a scatter graph. You know the old scatter graphs we used to have in school? You have a graph and then you have lots and lots of points and dots and whatnot. And it's very difficult to make sense of what's actually going on. And I'm skipping over some of the details of this because um, this uh, is gonna be the video which I'll give to you guys later. The main thing I want you to notice is these three things. Probabilistic framework, assumptions, disputes. These things exist. Whether you understand the details or not, that's not really relevant. Uh, so sometimes when biologists give us stories and they say this thing evolved because of this and this is how it evolved millions of years ago, these are sometimes called by biologists just so stories. The reason they call just so stories, which is uh, taken from the children book of Rudyard Kipling, which is just fables of children which are false, is because they don't, it's very hard to actually justify those things. How did a human being become bipedal? Why did we have bigger brains? What happened here? What happened there? Even some atheists, not all of them, even some rare atheist biologists like Richard Lewinton, who I have a picture of here, even he would say things like, these things are stories, right? We, they, we, we don't actually have an empirical basis for them. That doesn't mean they don't have empirical base for other stuff in evolutionary biology, but I'm just trying to show you the speculative nature of some of the content that they use to explain the human origin. And you have people like Raymond Tallis, who's another famous uh, philosopher and scientist, although he's an atheist, just like Richard Lewinton, who I mentioned before, he also basically says that, look, there's many things that from an evolutionary perspective, we're told this is this evolved this way, this evolved this way, but he says these things are basically baseless, right? And we also have to keep in mind the distinction between what's theoretically possible, what happened in the past, and what actually happened. Because nobody was there to witness everything. So whatever you reconstruct of the past is always gonna be probabilistic. Okay. Another thing which is used a lot is homology, right? Homology is the idea that similarities are due to common descent. Now, homology before Darwin, it wasn't known as similarities due to common descent. It was just known as similarities, right? So we're told, look, we're similar to chimpanzees, so therefore we have a common ancestor. But at the same time, we have fossils of things which are very similar, but they have no common origin, which is known as homoplasy, the exact opposite of homology. Uh, I'm not gonna go over this because this is quite philosophical and it's kind of irrelevant. But look, the main point is, if you look at the wing of a bat and a wing of a bird, right? This is not due to homology. This is not due to common ancestry. This is hom homoplasy. 
Likewise, we have echolocation in whales and echolocation in bats. However, um, echolocation in these two things is not due to common ancestry. Now, so far, I know some of you may be thinking this is like a crash course in biology. Uh, it's difficult to understand. I don't really know how this works and X, Y, Z. The main thing I want you guys to recognize here is the picture of evolution as being something very simple. So we've worked it out. We know how it works. This is simply not true. There's three things about it which are true. It's based on a probabilistic framework. There are assumptions and there are disputes about core ideas. So even if you pick up a book on the philosophy of biology, like Evidence in Evolution, which is published by Cambridge University, you'll find the likes of Elliot Sober saying things like this. Both of the following thoughts are naive. Humans and chimps must share a common ancestor because they're so similar. Humans and mushrooms must have arisen independently because they're so different. Within the probabilistic framework, there is no must in either case. So these things are based on probabilities and there's background assumptions there. It's not just a case of, you know, this is how it works and it works in no other way and we, we've worked it all out. So for example, and this is quite interesting when you think about it, human beings have similarities sociologically with ants, but we, is that those things are not due to common ancestry. And in terms of linguistics, we have similarity with songbirds. In terms of intelligence, we have, intel uh, we have the closest to us in terms of intelligence is actually crows, not chimpanzees. And this is very important to understand that um, when it comes down to, you know, somebody saying, oh, we're similar to chimpanzees, therefore we have a common ancestor. That's very problematic. Yeah, that's very, very problematic. It's not as simple as that. So we spoke about the probabilities which are involved. What are some of the assumptions? Well, firstly, Darwin himself spoke about the assumptions and spoke about the difficulties in this theory. So in The Origin of Species in chapter six, he actually talks about these problems in these theories. So this issue of the uh, Darwin's theory actually having assumptions and some of those assumptions being questionable, Darwin was honest enough to point this out himself right, in his actual origin of, of species. Um, so this is not something like that's, that's totally wild and totally out there. So we're gonna go over some of the assumptions. We have the assumption of gradualism. We have the assumption of uh, selfishness and obviously the tree of life. So gradualism works by, you know, small incremental variations is what we call them at the time of Darwin. Afterwards, they're known as random mutations. and those lead to basically an organism becoming uh, adapting to its environment and changing significantly over a long period of time. So evolution works very, very gradually. That's the assumption. But the problem with this assumption is that we have punctuated equilibrium. We have rapid evolution in terms of our fossil record. We have organisms appearing um, in a very quick uh, period of time, which is not gradualistic. And Darwin's theory has to work on gradualism. And this is actually known uh, famously as the problem of uh, the Cambrian explosion, which many people have worked on. Uh, and interestingly enough, even though the literature on the Cambrian explosion is very popular even today, the first person to point out the Cambrian explosion as a problem for gradualism was Darwin himself. But Darwin believed that the fossil record was going to help him out, but actually ended up not doing that. So we have the tree of life and the web of life. Uh, the tree of life is obviously Darwin's standard idea, but then later on biologists started saying, well, maybe the tree of life is false. Maybe it's the web of life. Maybe you have an interconnected web than having a, a tree which is branching out. Uh, two people who've championed this view are uh, Carl Woese, who actually discovered the third um, domain of life, Archaea. So he's a very famous uh, biologist, he's passed away now and Craig Venter, who's still alive, and he won the National Medal of Science in America. Both of these are secular mainstream biologists, but they've challenged the idea of the tree of life through the web of life. Now, you may be thinking, why did they replace, did they want to replace the tree of life with the web of life? What's going on? What's the science behind this? Look, the science is irrelevant for our purpose here. We can look into it if we want to. The real reason we want to uh, look into this is to show that 
look, science doesn't give you certainty. There's still a lot of discussion going on. There's still a lot of preliminary issues to be resolved when it comes to Darwin's theory. Okay, selfishness, right? Selfishness. Now, survival and reproduction is the primary rationale of life, as Richard Dawkins calls it. So everything that we do is fundamentally geared towards us being, uh, us increasing in survival and reproduction. So about this, I mean, I put down some quotes here, but uh, Richard Dawkins in The Selfish Gene, he mentions this again and again and again and again. And the way they explain it is, well, the reason why we help people is because they're related to us, which he calls, uh, which is known as kin selection, or we help people because they're going to help us back. And that's known as reciprocal altruism. So they say we're only nice to people because we want something back. That's the real issue. However, there's clear problems with this. And the clear problems is that firstly, human beings don't think like that. A lot of human beings, they help other human beings and they have no uh, financial gain or no reproductive gain or anything like that. They're just helping people because they want to help people. And helping someone for the sake of helping somebody, helping somebody just because you want to, without you wanting something in return, this is essentially maladaptive. It's something which doesn't help you survive. So it's a mystery and it doesn't fit within Darwin's theory. So this is, the evolution of morality is such a difficult topic for Darwinists to actually explain. And according to some, some evolutionary biologists like the uh, biologist Dennis Noble, all the central assumptions of neo-Darwinism have been disproven, right? What the assumptions of neo-Darwinism and, uh, and the, like gradualism and, and, and the way genes are transferred and so on and so forth. I want you guys to understand his view is a minority view. It's not the majority view, it's the minority view. However, I just wanted to put it in there to show there's a discussion going on, there's a dispute going on, there's still a lot of dialogue going on. The way Darwin's theory is shown like, oh my God, it's true, oh my God, it's unbelievable, no one can challenge it, this is simply false. And I want you guys to understand something. Um, there's two things here. There's homology, which is their claim that similarity is due to common descent. And there's natural selection, which is the force which creates uh, these organisms. These can be thought of like a bridge. So you have the bridge, uh, you, have the, you have the pillars, and then you have the road. The pillars you can think of as the tree of life or a particular branch on the tree of life. And the, and the road is natural selection, which creates it. The problem is these two things are linked. And if the Darwinian mechanism is questionable, the Darwinian history of life is also questionable. The tree of life is also questionable. And that's what a lot of people don't recognize that you can't just challenge the mechanism and assume that the, th the tree of life is fine. Okay, there are paradigm shifting disputes within evolutionary biology which are actually taking place. There are complete alternatives to Darwin's theory. Evolution by natural genetic engineering, neo Lamarckian evolution, mutation driven evolution, right? And the biologist Michael Rose, he explains it in this, in this way the complexity of biology is comparable to quantum mechanics. It's crazy, it's difficult, it's, it's very complex. It's not how people perceive it to be. And we really need to recognize this because a lot of people, they don't recognize that it is a lot more complicated than the way it's actually projected, right? And we have projects like the third way of evolution in which biologists from all across the world, uh, you know, Europe, China, uh, North America, Oxford, Princeton, you know, MIT, Harvard, all these places, they basically challenge Darwinian evolution and they want to replace it with another type of evolution. They want to replace the mechanism. Now you may not, I mean, you can check out their website. You may not know all of the people here. You may not know what the, what they're, what they're writing about, and what their objective is, you just need to keep something in mind. Number one, they're a minority, but they are secular mainstream biologists. They're not creationists, they're not religious people. And they're challenging Darwin based upon science, not based on religion. 
And that just shows you a clear example of the disputes that actually exist. Okay, now it comes down to the important point and the point which I think is very, very much brings home why we're speaking about this topic. Everything else that I mentioned previously, that's just to show that science changes and Darwin's theory is like any other scientific theory, it's not absolute. But this is the claim that hardcore militant atheists have, that Darwin's theory means there's no God. Richard Dawkins says this, he says, uh, you know, da he, Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist, yeah? So do, he seems to think it leads to atheism, yeah? If you're an atheist, if you're, and even says this publicly, he wants people to uh, not believe in God, he wants people to believe in evolution, and he, and he tries to see, show them as they're linked. And also people like Yuval Noah Hariri, who also mentions uh, this in a way that you would start to think um, that these things are linked. However, the problem is these people, they don't really represent the classical view of Darwinian evolution. Like Darwinian evolution is being misused by these people to show that supposedly there's no God, right? The reality is that the existence of God is independent of Darwin's theory being true or not. If it's true or if it's not true, it doesn't challenge Darwin's theory. And there's many people who've actually written about how Darwin's theory is not just a valid scientific theory, it's also become into a religion. It's also become into a philosophy. And that's very dangerous. Now, Julian Huxley was an evolutionary biologist. He was an atheist philosopher as well, who wrote about Darwinism as religion. And even today we have people like Michael Roos, who's also writing about Darwinism as religion. Um, interestingly enough, we have atheist evolutionary biologists who have complained about Darwinian evolution being like a religion and then not having enough oxygen, ideological oxygen to actually express their views. Uh, we have the likes of Jerry Fodor, who recently passed away, uh, Lynn Margulis, Maswata Shinai. So these people who actually complain about the fact that alternatives to Darwin are not being explored. If alternatives to Darwinism are not being explored. Okay, now I want to summarize what this presentation was about. And I then want to have an open Q&A and have a discussion with you guys. Look, I know I went through this in a way that normally it takes me, what, three hours or whatever. Um, but it's really enough for you guys to understand a few points. The first point is, Darwin's theory does not deny the existence of God. It doesn't matter if it's true. Even Darwin recognized you could believe in his theory and you can believe in God. When he published The Origin of Species, he was a deist. He did believe in God. He didn't believe in religion, but he believed in God. Later on in life, he became an agnostic because of the problem of evil. However, nothing, nothing, nothing at all is it within the evolutionary theory that forces you to become an atheist. That's simply not true. Okay. However, even though Darwin's theory is a valid scientific theory, a valid scientific theory doesn't mean it's true. It just means it's a valid scientific theory. This is another misconception that we think valid scientific theory means true. It doesn't. Why? Because of the philosophy of science. The philosophy of science teaches us no scientific theory can be absolutely true, right? Because you can always get new data. You can always reinterpret the data. You can always have assumptions in there, ultimately still based on methodological naturalism. So even though it's a valid theory, it doesn't undermine God, it's not absolute, and thirdly, it's not as undisputable as people try and make it look. Even though it's a valid theory, it's still based on a probabilistic framework. There still are assumptions involved, and some of those assumptions are questionable, and there are core disputes about it as a theory. Till today, there are core disputes, However, it is a valid scientific theory and it's the prevailing paradigm at the moment within evolutionary biology. However, it's also not just a theory, it's used as a secular religion by atheists to promote atheism. And that's what we want to stop. So the ultimate issue is not human chimpanzee ancestry. If a non-Muslim comes up to you and they believe in human chimpanzee ancestry, your job is not to teach them that that's not right. Your job is to teach them there is a God and it doesn't matter whether you believe in human chimpanzee history. Darwin's theory does not undermine that. So I hope in this short presentation you've understood 
that Darwin's theory is not absolute, it's not as true as people make it look, it's a valid scientific theory, but we can have a discussion about it. And in the Dawa, it's definitely not something which can undermine Islam. So I hope in this short presentation, you've understood at least some of what I was trying to convey, and I look forward to your questions. So Anis, uh, what, is there any questions we have so far? Well, khairan, brother Ahmed. It was really beneficial presentation for us. Now, inshallah, I'll read to you for some questions. Uh, Isin Kantar says, can you explain what does evolution mean according to modern science? I think, you know, when you explain, there are a lot of theories and a lot of models. So then at the end of the day, how does modern science like summarize what is actually evolution? Well, look, um, there's no one definition. Yeah, we always have to remember this. Uh, at the popular level, we just say evolution, but on the academic level, evolution as generally biological change over time, that's just something everybody believes in. That's not an issue. Evolution in the sense of uh, the tree of life, that there is a tree of life, everything is connected. Pretty much every biologist in the world, they believe this sort of thing. They believe this is what happened, right? Evolution in terms of natural selection, that's something where there is doubt. That is something where there's a lot of very angry biologists who don't believe in Darwinism and there's a lot of fighting going on, right? And these two things are linked. The, the mechanism of evolution is linked to the history of life, the tree of life. A lot of people don't recognize that. Even academics don't recognize that. You have to remember that Darwin's theory was uh, the idea that the tree of life, that all, all living organisms go back to a tree of life. This was known before Darwin. Going back even to the ancient Indus civilization almost 3,000 years ago, this was well known. The issue is to do with the mechanism, because the mechanism is the core thing that Darwin came up with. So at the moment, that is within academic circles, there is a valid discussion. And Alhamdulillah, now you're seeing it more and more where atheist evolutionary biologists are basically questioning it. They're still the minority, but there is that. It's still going on. All right, the question continues. Is yes. there any discrepancies with Islamic basics? It means the evolution. If there's any discrep discrepancies with uh, Islamic basics. Islamic what? Basics. He says Islamic basics. Is there any... Oh, Islamic basics. You see, um, this is a very complicated issue. This is a very complicated issue. Like I mentioned... There are some Muslim, assuming Darwin's theory is true, literally, the tree of life is true, literally. There's some Muslims who say it's impossible to reconcile Darwinian evolution with Islam. Other Muslims who say it's completely uh, acceptable. Yeah, we, will, we, we can accept all of it and explain it within an Islamic context. And they do it by saying there's a second creation of Adam alayhi salam on earth or Allah sent down the soul of Adam alayhi salam or, you know, all these types of things. Then there's people in the middle. There's people in the middle. There's people who say we can accept the evolution of, Adam, uh, of animals, right? We can accept before Adam alayhi salam, there was Homo erectus, Homo naladi, Denisovans, these types of things. But Adam, but Adam alayhi salam is an exceptional creation. And then that exceptional creation then interbred with the other sorts of hominids. There's all these types of models, but it doesn't really matter. Yeah, whether you are here, you are here or you're here. It doesn't matter. Um, like I said before, uh, during the time of the Ottoman Empire, uh, at the time when Darwin was putting out these ideas, there was a lot of discussion amongst Turkish ulama on this issue. Some were saying, if Darwin is, if, Dar if Darwinian evolution is shown to be true, here's how we can reconcile it. Yeah? But they said, um, we don't believe there's enough evidence for it. Yeah? So, and even today, you find uh, people talking like this, people saying, well, if, it is, if, there, if in the future we get enough evidence, then there are ways we can explain it. I personally think these discussions, they're irrelevant for the non-Muslim and they're irrelevant for the Muslim 
uh, masses, these are scholarly discussions people have, it's enough to show understanding the theory that the theory does not undermine God and does not undermine Islam and does not undermine the truthfulness of Islam. And that's all we need to know. Where does it conflict with Islam or does it or does it not? I think that's kind of an irrelevant discussion because that's something where people will um, they'll go off for years into discussion. What does this narration mean? You know, what, what's the meaning of this? Is this possible? Is it not? And these are very sophisticated scholarly discussions. Um, I'm not really in favor of them, but people do them. You know, alhamdulillah, they want to do something uh, uh, to try and, uh, you know, facilitate a discussion. Uh, no problem. But I think for a da'i, for the people, for the people like yourselves who are out there calling to Allah, having discussions with people, it's irrelevant. It's irrelevant. Um, it's, it, it's, it, it, all that's relevant is it's a valid scientific theory, but it's not absolutely true and it doesn't undermine God, doesn't undermine Islam. When a non Muslim says, does it fit if it was true? That's irrelevant. That's still irrelevant. You know, you can tell them, look, many people have different views, but, you know, uh, we, we Muslims, we need to be pragmatists. Yeah. We need to understand what's relevant, what's not. So Allah mentions the story in uh, chapter 18 of the Quran in which you have young people and there's five of them and the six is the dog or the six of them and seven is the dog or there's seven of them, the eight is the dog. Allah says these people are guessing, you know, only Allah knows the number. Now, is it really important for us to know the number? Really important for us to know the number? No, it's not. What's important to know is Allah did a miracle. Allah put them to sleep for 300 years. So when it comes to Islam and Darwinian evolution, a lot of people, they want to be like, what happened exactly? What exactly happened? And the fact is, we'll probably never get to that. But what's enough for us to know is whatever Allah has said in the Quran is true. How that fits into reality, how that fits into the history of life or history of evolution, the tree of life is irrelevant, is irrelevant. Um, it doesn't undermine the truthfulness of Islam. So I hope that's the answer which uh, is comprehensive. All right, there's a but at least for the purposes here. There's another question from Al Farstan. He says, in the past, there was like, uh, it was said that the camel is breaking the law of evolution, and it was in the verses. Uh, and also, I want to add to that is like we have this kind of works, like, uh, for example, written by a famous Turkish guy, Harun Yahya. He, he, he writes a book like showing a lot of things and trying to disprove like the Dar 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 Darwinian theory and stuff like that. What is your op opinion? Shall we use like this kind of methods or not? Okay, so the thing with Harun Yahya is, look, um, I don't like to attack any Muslim. I don't like to say bad things about people. Uh, I think as Muslims, we, we, we shouldn't be fighting. We shouldn't be saying stuff. But Harun Yahya is very, very popular, uh, and I feel compelled to criticize him because I think it does a lot of damage. Okay, so I've I've read his stuff. Uh, I know of his stuff. I obviously grew up uh, with some of the things that he, you know, teaches and stuff because he's very, very popular. Um, his books are all over the world and in every mosque and you know this type of stuff. The problem is that. Firstly, a lot of the criticisms that he makes of uh, biological evolution, of, of Darwin's evolution, he uses them to say Darwin's theory is not scientific. That's what he's trying to say. But that's going too far. So if you look at a lot of the problems that he raises, which, by the way, are uh, the same the same problems which are raised in by North American uh, creationists and North American uh, evangelicals. It's the same thing. Um, he goes uses these problems like the Cambrian explosion, like gradualism, like these assumptions to try and show it's not scientific. Okay, and I think that's wrong. I think that's completely wrong. It is scientific, but. It doesn't mean it's true. Now, he wants to say it's not even science. Yeah, it's not even science. Number two, he goes over all of the weak points of evolution, 
the, the problems with it, the problems with Darwinian evolution, without mentioning also some of the evidences for it. Because to be fair as a Muslim, you need to give evidence for and evidence against and do a balance. He just does attack, 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 attack. Yeah, which to be honest, um, is it, as a Muslim, uh, you know, Allah says in the Quran, speak the truth even if it's against yourself. So I think he does a lot of damage by doing that, um, by, by continuing, by pretending as if there's no, they don't even have an argument. The third problem that I have with him is he goes off too much into conspiracy theories. Yeah. Um, some of the things that he says, I do believe are true, right? So for example, there, there is a link between um, Darwinian evolution and Western imperialism and capitalism. That's not hidden. Even Western academics have spoken about that. But to go off into, you know, Satanism, not Satanism, but, you know, the, the whole conspiracy side of things and the way he explains it, the New World Order. Um, I don't know. That's, I, I think those sort of things, those, those become a little bit counterproductive. Yeah. So my personal advice to people, I wouldn't advise people to read Harun Yahya stuff. Um, I don't think it's helpful. Um, I think it, 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 it gives you the wrong impression of evolution as well. Um, and there's a lot more sophisticated work being done by great people in Turkey. Uh, Turkey is actually the hub of intellectual dialogues on, on uh, evolution. Uh, and it's been going on, like I said, since the time of Darwin. Um, and I think Harun Yahya is, is very different. He's like somebody who uh, came in the scene with his colorful books and all of his stuff and lots of money and this type of stuff. And the serious discussion which is happening amongst the scholars in Turkey, the scholars in Egypt, the scholars in other parts of the Muslim world, you know, those serious scholarly discussions, he wasn't even having any of it. He was just like doing his own thing and this type of thing. So I'm not too keen on his stuff. Um, there was a time when I really liked it when I was a teenager, <laughs> you know, um, but uh, I, I, now I'm, I'm not in favor of it at all. Uh, that, that's my view at the moment. By the way, the first part of the question uh, that camels can break the, the line in evolution. I, I don't know what that means. The camel is breaking the law of evolution. I oh. think. It, it, a, a, a fallacy maybe i don't know you know better yeah i don't understand that is question any... so th there is nothing like you have read before that about about the camel which is like uh breaking the law of evolution it's not evolving or somehow things like that i don't know i, I can't think of anything because you have to remember that um evolution is such a vast field i mean i haven't looked at all of the stuff on camels. I haven't looked at all of the stuff on most animals. I um, mean, you spend your life going through everything. Uh, you just go through the big areas, how they construct the theory, what the conclusions are, the, uh, you know, the imperatives are, stuff like that. It's, but this thing I don't really understand. All right. There's another uh, question from Hikmet. I see from your presentation that you claim that there are a lot of problems with Darwin's theory of evolution, especially the transition in between the different species. However, I believe we shouldn't disregard that the theory could be partially correct to an extent. For example, certain variations within a species could come to existence as a result of evolution. Polar bear and brown bear, for example, what is your opinion about this aspect? No, that's true. That's true. Um, and I'm sorry if I gave the impression that I'm just totally saying all of it's like wrong or whatever. Um, that wasn't really my intention. Maybe it's just the way I came across. But yeah, he's right. Um, they, they, they are certainly, uh, you know, transitional. Just because there's transition missing in the fossil record, it doesn't mean that those things are completely ruled out. Those could still take place. So, yeah. I sort of agree with this comment. All right. There's a question. Do you think that Darwin theory is scientific? I think you have already mentioned that yeah, yeah. it's a valid scientific theory. Yeah. Yeah. You see, I want to answer this again because look, 
you know, Harun Yahya for many, many years, he's been saying it's not scientific, it's not scientific, it's not scientific. And a majority of Muslims, whether you're in Saudi Arabia, you're in Pakistan, you're in Nigeria, they'll say the same thing. I don't think there's any place on earth where Harun Yahya books haven't gone. Yeah. So Muslims are used to saying it's not scientific. And when a Muslim says it's scientific, other Muslims think that Muslim is saying it's true. There's a difference between saying it's scientific and it's true. Two different things. Yeah. So we're just saying it's scientific. We're not saying it's true, literally. All right. Seems like there's no more questions. Uh, let, let, let's wait a little bit. Maybe it's coming. Uh, someone's just asking, can you share the presentation with me? So yeah. what, what, what we can do is, for those who want to have the presentation, uh, we will share our uh, corporate number, WhatsApp number. Just message us on that uh, WhatsApp number. Then I'll receive the presentation from Brother Ahmed and we'll be sending you, inshallah. Just request with a message that we want this presentation to our WhatsApp number, inshallah. Yeah. Uh, I'm just sending it to you via WhatsApp. So yeah, you can tell me, then I can send those who want it from us, inshallah. The, the presentation also includes a philosophy of science as well. And I'll also send some videos which you guys can watch on this topic. Look, um, Anis, um, I want everybody to understand that what I said right at the beginning, right, which was probably the first slide, yeah, um, the most important thing is, it's a valid theory, but it doesn't undermine God, it doesn't undermine Islam. So even if someone believes it to be true, it doesn't undermine Islam, and it doesn't mean there's no God. This is the most important thing, because a lot of people, they get into discussions about the science, yeah? But it's not about the science. It's about the conceptual philosophical idea that Darwinian evolution does not undermine God and does not undermine Islam. That's enough. We don't need to get into any more discussions. All right. There's someone asking the difference between evolutionist theory and Darwinian theory. I think you mentioned a little bit. Yeah. The I can go over it again. Uh -huh. So look, there's many different types of evolutionary models. There's uh, natural genetic engineering, uh, neo-mutationism, uh, what Lamarckian, Lamarckian evolution, right? Um, Darwinian evolution, the mechanism is natural selection. It's a blind mechanical force. Um, so that's the difference. It's just a different evolutionary model. And if the Darwinism had some racist proponents, yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, you know, Darwin himself, he believed the white people to be the most superior than Asians and people going all the way down to the blacks and blacks being the worst. Also, Darwin, uh, during the time that he was alive, the Ottomans, uh, they were fighting against Europeans. And when the Ottomans lost a particular war, this is, I think, 1870s, Darwin said the savage Turks have been beaten hollow by the civilized races, right? So he can, he, you know, he used words like savages, right, for Turks and savages for blacks and others. So um, even within uh, like the greatest are the white people and then going down are the black people. But even amongst white people, he said the English are the most superior, they're better than the French and the Portuguese and the Spanish because the English are better at colonization. Um, so the English are the first, the, 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 the top, the hierarchy within the white people. I mean, racism is, a, is, is you find it everywhere. <laughs> I mean, nowadays you don't. Nowadays they, they're pretending like it doesn't exist. They, they cover that part and they try and make it unscientific. But it's, it's there. It's it, inherently within the theory we have a racist um, it's not that a racist person came up with the theory, because Darwin, you know, it wasn't like that. It's that the theory itself has race, racist implications, that certain races are better than others. So Brother Hikmet is saying that we can maybe say as Muslims, we are against random evolution. Yes, this is very important point, correct. very important point. Uh, Sorry? 
uh, like as I said, he says that we are against random evolution as Muslims. Yes, yes. Um, so yeah, we're against random. That's very, very important to understand. I, I really like that he said that because randomness is theologically a problem for us, that things are just doing randomly and Allah doesn't know, astaghfirullah. You know, Allah knows everything. So that's the mechanism. And to be honest, randomness and what does randomness mean and, and you know, that whole discussion, we need to have a thing about it because uh, we need to have a discussion about it because is it really the case that Darwinian evolution is random? Or is it directed? Or is it guided? Or is there something else going on? So the randomness aspect is, is the problematic part. And you take that out and it becomes a lot more palatable. Yeah. And even the Muslims who try and make Darwinian evolution compatible with, the, with Islam, they will not accept randomness. Randomness is the key thing that we have to basically, um, uh, you know, explain that we don't accept this. All right, JazakAllah Khair. And there's uh, one question. Uh, Elif Ajar says, maybe I missed this part. So we know that we are coming from Adam and Hava. So what do you think about being different color in scientific way? Is it so easy to say even if evolution is true, it doesn't undermine Islam? Islamic sources have, have explanations of the creation in Quran, authentic sunnah and explanation of scholars that are compatible with at least some explanations of evolution today. Okay, if I understand so, the question. I'll just summarize. So the first one is saying that uh, how do we tackle with uh, the Adam and Hawa, alayhi salam, uh, being different colors in, in scientific way? What do you so, think of different colors in scientific way? I mean, the color thing, uh, I don't really know how to answer. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't see what the issue is with color. Color is... Um, you know, you, you get variations over time and, and, and you know, people uh, adapt to the environment. People have colors related to the environments that they're in. So uh, it's not really an issue. And I don't see what the question about the color is. But what's the second part of the question? Uh, the second part was about uh, maybe he says I missed this part. So we know that we are coming from Adam and Hawa. So how do we like relate this? There's also other questions about this. So this is asked a lot. Yeah. So, so basically, you, look. You're saying Adam, that doesn't it undermine uh, Islam? Like, yeah. From the look, it, of the it, it, look, it doesn't for several reasons. The first is that Islam we believe to be true. And we have evidence why the Quran is true. Science doesn't give you truth, but it gives you models workable models which can be falsified which can be shown wrong and which can change and stuff like this so science is not giving you certainty the quran is certain so initially there's no problem conceptually you can't use something that's speculative to challenge something which is or probabilistic to challenge something that we know with certainty so that's the first point the second point is even if it's true like i said darwin's theory is not true literally it's it's, it's a working model even if it's true, there's ways that Muslims have tried to explain that, explain that. And I explained that, obviously, there's some Muslims who say it's, it's not the case. But firstly, there's nothing incoherent about the fact that before Adam salam was created, and we're all the children of Adam, there were other creatures which Allah had on earth, which were hominids of some sort, Homo Nuladi, Denisovans, uh, Homo erectus. I mean, nothing, there's nothing problematic about that at all. Yeah. Um, and then you have other people who go off into, well, maybe Allah created Adam and Islam, not sent from Jannah, but created a second creation on earth. Some people say that, uh, you know, his soul came down. Other people say different things. Or that when they came down, then they interbred with the Neanderthals and other hominids. And so we are the children of Adam alayhi salam, but we also um, have that. See, all these discussions, and there's volumes and volumes and volumes of these discussions. I skip all these discussions, and I go back to something which is speculative, cannot challenge something which is certain. So it doesn't matter. And the way that people have tried to explain it, the Muslims who are on the different uh, ranges, so that the Muslims 
like Harun Yahya will be on this end. He'll be like, we will not accept it at all. Not even animal evolution. Yeah? And then you'll have other Muslims who are going to try and make it all compatible. I leave all those discussions and I say, it's enough for us to know it doesn't undermine God and it doesn't undermine Islam. Because something that's uncertain cannot undermine what's certain. All right, let's see if there's another question. Someone says it would be easier to say it doesn't undermine the belief of God, but is it easy to say it is compatible with Islam? Again, it's not easy to say it's compatible with Islam, they're right. Because you need to do some work. If it's true, if Darwin's theory is actually true, how is it compatible? How? That's, that's a very, you know, you're going to have to come up with models. You're going to have to do some explanation. But is it easy to say it doesn't undermine Islam? Yes, because it's not certain in the first place, right? It's based on a probabilistic framework. There's assumptions, there's disputes, there's methodological naturalism, which is the assumption. There's the philosophy of science. So even if it was true, there's ways that it can be reconciled. And, you know, scholars have said, you know, this can happen, that can happen, that can happen. I skip all those discussions and I say, well, it's irrelevant anyway, because right now we know it's uncertain and science doesn't give you certainty. And we've got these issues. So it doesn't undermine Islam. Something which is uncertain cannot undermine what is certain. All right, there's another one. Is, is the Darwin, Darwin's theory the only way that can explain the evolution of animals or there are other theories for the evolution of animals rather than the Darwin's theory? Yeah, they, they're trying to come up with Lamarckian evolution, natural genetic engineering, uh, neo-mutationism. They're trying to come up with these models, yeah. There are other ways they try and explain it because they don't think it's sufficient. They don't think Darwin's theory is sufficient to explain it. All right. There are a lot of comments I'm trying to just catch all of them. Someone is asking if there's any reading would you, you would recommend. Philip Johnson has a book called Darwin on Trial. I would recommend that book. That's the best book on this topic at the moment. Can you write the readings and links of the video at the end? Uh, yes, I can. Yeah, so like while I'm trying to read the questions, maybe if you can do it. On the I'll just box. WhatsApp you. All right. Actually, I'll put, I'll put it in the... Uh, Again and again, uh, like they're popping up this uh, Adam and Hava question. Someone is just saying yep. that some, some Muslims trying to explain that this uh, Adam and uh, Hava story was actually symbolic or figurative in a sort of way. Uh, like they're, they're asking your comments on this. Yeah, you see, um, like I said before, I don't like getting into these discussions about... Um, how is how can it be reconciled can this happen can that happen xyz and i do appreciate that the scholars and the people who are trying to say that if it's true here's how we can reconcile it and they give different models some of those models and ideas they're more respectable and logical and coherent than others um like I mentioned, uh, the second creation of Adam or um, Adam and Islam coming down and then interbreeding with other hominids or maybe uh, something else. But the idea that Adam Islam and Hawa are metaphors, I don't think that's rational. I think, you know, like I said, there's those people who, like Harun Yahya, they totally deny it. There's those people who try and make it totally compatible. Yeah. And there's those people in the middle those models, those still include Adam al-Islam being a real literal person and so is Hawa. How, how exactly, um, that's obviously, they try and explain it in their ways. But what's important to understand is this. 
the idea that Adam and Hawa are metaphors, they're not even real people, that's nonsensical. Right, so I think that's completely nonsensical. I think the other way is that they try and reconcile it. Um, the ulama, I think that's like you know, I wouldn't do that myself, but I can understand how it works. But the idea that, and, and there's some Muslims who said this that Adam al Islam is a metaphor and uh, you know, Hawa is a metaphor, I think that's completely irrational. Um, I, I don't think there's any basis for that. Yeah, uh, that that's not that's not a rational compatibility thesis that's that's basically saying science is true and let's make the quran fit the science yeah that's not a proper way of doing it if you want to do a compatibilism uh, a compatibilism type of project then you need to look at the science for the, the sciences you need to look at what the quran says and not twist it yeah because if we say adam is a metaphor we can say isa is a metaphor we can say jannah is a metaphor yeah. Where does it end? It, 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 it's a very problematic thing if, if people try and say that. All right. Jazakallah. And by the way, you just mentioned that there are some other scholars in Turkey rather than the uh, uh, Harun Yahya. Can you recommend some of the Turkish scholars in this? Um, I can't think of them at the top of my head, but there's a, there's a professor that um, I'm doing a lot of work with evolution on. I'm going to ask him about it, uh, and I think he may have some papers on it. Uh, stay tuned to my channel, Darwinian Delusions. This Friday, uh, not this Friday, next Friday, I'm going to go live with that professor again. And he's done a lot of research into Turkish scholars and what they've said. His name is Professor Shweb Ahmed Malik. He's got his own um, YouTube channel, his own Facebook. Um, you can ask him directly on Facebook. He's very active. Or you can ask him on the live stream that we're going to do in two weeks' time. But he's the one who actually knows the name, and he's the one who actually told me about them. And he, named, he mentioned the names, but I've forgotten. <laughs> I've actually completely forgotten. Uh, what, what was his name again? Shoheib? Shoheib Ahmed Malik. Is there? Mm -hmm. I'll get his YouTube and I'll send it to you. I mean, his, his uh, Facebook. Can you guys see my screen? So, uh, soon they'll have a live uh, YouTube. Uh, not now. Did you, did you send a message now? Let's check. Okay, but anyway, I WhatsApped it to you. You can send it to the participants. Sorry. So I'll just write uh, the, the, the Facebook address as well. Uh, by the way, for those, again, who want to give this presentation and all the other details, like the, the, the YouTube channel of uh, Brother Sabur, which you can do it yourself, Darwinian Delusions, and other lectures, you can just write uh, us a message on that number. We just shared the number. So we'll be sharing you all those details again. But I'm going to just uh, put that Facebook link uh, of the, yeah. the live discussion uh, for the last. Then after that, we're going to be finishing this discussion inshallah by the way for those who attended this discussion uh, your feedback is also important we'll share with you a, a feedback form please uh, fill it up and let's help us to improve ourselves inshallah i think there's no more questions for now excellent uh, again jazakallah khairam brother ahmed uh, we are all welcome to hosting you inshallah uh, by the way, uh, I was thinking if we can do a more like uh, detailed workshop, maybe like two hours or, or more during the Ramadan. Let's discuss, inshallah, for this. If Inshallah. If Ram Ramadan is going to be a bit difficult. Uh, after Ramadan will be better. All right. Maybe we can do it after Ramadan. for. A yeah, we can, do one on a we can do one on atheism. Uh, myself and Imran, we can do one on atheism. All right, that would be really good, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. 
Selamu aleyküm ve rahmetullahi ve berekatuhu. See you all inşallah. Cezaklar. Aleykümselam.